Today, uh, in our German Clinic seminar series, we're going to have uh, Pro Joy, Professor uh, Joseph Davis. Uh, so just a short uh, intro, and the, the way we run this is, as usual, uh, he's going to be giving a talk. If there's any questions, I think we have flexibility on, uh, on, on, on clarifying. But usually, we go through the talk, and we keep a few minutes by the end, and we need to, to stop sharp, yes, at 5, otherwise, uh, it becomes like uh, we, we, we experienced in the past that it can really go uh, longer. So um, again, on this short bio, uh, Professor Joseph Davis received his bachelor's degree in computer science and, bio and biological engineering at UC Berkeley. And he completed his PhD in biology at MIT on the direction of professors Bob Sauer and Tanya Baker. Following an appointment as a senior scientist at Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, Joey performed research at the Scripps Research and with professors Jamie Williamson and Malin Hansen as a Jane Coffin Childs and K99 postdoctoral fellow. In 2018, Joey returned to MIT as the Whitehead Assistant Professor in the Department of Biology. And here, his lab develops and applies structural and biochemical techniques to understand ribosome biogenesis and the formation of eukaryotic autophagosomes. This work is supported by Alfred Pizlan Foundation, NSF, NIH, and the German Clinic for Machine Learning at Health at MIT. And uh, we're just discussing a moment ago, but outside his lab, uh, Joey enjoys uh, surfing, even in New Hampshire, skiing in his hometown in Colorado, and watching his two-year-old, and now a new one, come uh, there as well, uh, begin to explore the world. The world. So, uh, Joey, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, please, the stage is yours, is yours, so uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks so much for a really nice intro. Um, so, you, um, Nasia and I were just talking, you know, it's a really nice sized group, and so I think we can make this relatively informal, and so if folks want to just interrupt, feel free to unmute yourself or turn on your camera and wave your arms or, or whatever you want to do. I'm happy to sort of slow down and talk about elements in more detail if you're interested. Um, so as, as Ignacio mentioned, you know, my lab, um, we do sort of a mix of computational and experimental work. And the, the goal with all of that work is to really try to understand how proteins and protein complexes function in the cell. Um, and we approach that, again, sort of computationally and experimentally. On the experimental side, it's mostly trying to understand their structures um, because we sort of believe that structure informs function. And so, you know, this is not probably a hugely new idea to, to certain folks in this audience, but, um, you know, over the last 25 or 30 years, the structural biology community in general has made a lot of headway in determining the structures of proteins and protein complexes that sort of drive life. Right? These are things like the ribosome that give rise to new proteins, things like RNA and DNA polymerases that allow us to replicate our DNA or produce messenger RNA, uh, metabolic enzymes that allow us to turn over primary metabolites and, and make the sort of things that we need to grow as a cell. Um, and, and so this is sort of shown, you know, this is from David Goodsell, um, just the sort of plethora of structures that you see. Um, and, and the way that we've gotten most of these structures has been through processes like X-ray crystallography. And the way that this basically works is that you um, find talented graduate students that are interested in some structure. You convince them to clone that gene into an expression system. They'll express it. And over the course of a week, um, they'll purify it. And they take that purified protein and put it in some conditions that lead to crystallization. So these proteins are going to sort of pack into a crystalline lattice. And in that crystalline lattice, we can then um, fire x-rays at it, generate diffraction spots, and from those diffraction spots, infer an electron density map, and then from that map, try to build in some model of the protein. Um, and, that, and that's sort of what gives rise to what's in the background there. And so you can imagine, you know, when you have these crystalline lattices, the molecules are sort of, by definition, locked into a homogeneous conformation. They're packed together into this crystalline lattice. And that's some low energy conformation that they have to adopt to, to go into this crystalline structure, right? And so that requires that they're static and effectively structurally homogeneous. Now, now in reality, you know, there's this sort of nice quote that these molecules are not static, but instead they dance on a complex energy landscape. Right? These things are dynamic, they're moving, they're flexible, and that's what allows them to carry out all the functions that enable life, right? And you know, just one, you know, there's thousands of these examples, but, but one that you might think about is, uh, sorry, I need this arrow to advance this slide, um, is something we've been thinking about right now with COVID is this is the sort of spike protein of um, SARS-CoV-2. And one of its key roles is to um, initiate fusion between the um, lipid envelope of the virus and, and a um, eukaryotic cell. And it does that by extending 
these alpha helices down into this membrane. And then through a series of coupled conformational changes, it actually physically pulls these two membranes together, right? It's gonna pull these membranes together until they're in enough proximity to fuse and that allows the virus to now enter the cell and go off and replicate and, and, and cause all the damage that has led to um, my daycare, my son's daycare getting shut down, right? So, so like these things have real consequences. Um, but what's I think maybe interesting from thinking about this in terms of a computer science problem is that all the structures of that protein that I just showed you, they have the same primary sequence, right? Compositionally, they haven't changed at all as this protein went through these concerted motions to carry out this function. And yet it, it does these things, right? And so, you know, there's been a lot of interest and excitement about AlphaFold and AlphaFold is incredible. It's this, um, uh, this, this AI-based um, protein structure prediction program out of DeepMind that allows you to go from primary sequence to tertiary structures, but you go to a sort of single static tertiary structure. And what I'm sort of interested in is trying to understand the dynamics of proteins and protein complexes, because I think that that's what's gonna get us to function. Okay, so how might one go about doing that? If X-ray crystallography locks things into a static structure and direct prediction methods maybe have promise in the future, but right now are sort of limited to static structures, uh, I'm gonna present an approach that I think has a lot of promise and that's single particle, um, cryo-electron microscopy. So the way this works is you start with sort of the same material as you would with crystallography. You have a purified protein sample, and now you're going to apply it to an electron microscopy grid. So this is either a gold or a copper grid. It's roughly three millimeters across. And then you're going to image that with an electron microscope. So this is really a nice visual, I think, of what's happening in this imaging process. It sort of zooms in um, so you can eventually see the molecules. So this is obviously just light microscopy, getting closer and closer. Each one of these bars is one of these gold or copper bars. And as we get closer and closer, you'll see there has been a thin layer of amorphous carbon deposited up top these bars and cut into that amorphous carbon. You can see these small holes. Okay. Each one of these holes is something on the order of like a micron across. <clears throat> and it turns out in those holes, and so now you can actually start to see each one of these individual holes, We've applied our sample and then we've rapidly frozen it um, such that it freezes so quickly you get um, vitreous ice. And our protein ideally is in those holes. And so if we just keep zooming in further and further and further and then apply a little bit of image processing, you can now actually see these are individual protein molecules, you know, something on the order of a few, maybe um, you know, five to 10 nanometers across. Um, and we can see each one of these individual molecules. And what is so cool about electron microscopy is that you have these molecules ideally frozen in a native state, and you have you know, somewhere between tens of thousands and millions of them. And if you've frozen them quickly enough, you hope that you've captured them in whatever sort of structural or conformational state they were in. Uh, and then- Let me the, interrupt the, you, Jay. Yeah. So just on, this is not visible, right? So basically we are reconstructing this using some techniques to make it visible, right? So, yeah, that's right. So. This is, this is an image out of the electron microscope. We've low pass filtered it, so it's a little bit easier to see the individual particles. But the computational challenge is going from these particles, which you can see are very low signal to noise ratios, right? These are pretty hard to see. It's hard to imagine that we could figure out where individual atoms are. From these. Right. But what I'll show you in a few minutes is that if you average enough of these particles together and you're sort of smart about how you pick the things that you average, you can actually build up enough signal to start to see 3D density maps. I see, thank you. Right. So, um, you know, here's sort of what you do. So, so you would have an image like this, you would go through and pick all of your individual particles. And there's really nice neural network based approaches to do this particle picking. Some of them also developed at MIT and Bonnie Berger's group. You would extract each one of these particles. And so this is what sort of your raw 2D images look like. So these are end up being um, sort of projections through the Z axis, through the imaging axis of all of the electron density that was in the molecule sort of integrated into this frame. But you can see that there's extremely low signal to noise. And that low signal to noise results in part because we just can't dose the samples enough. We're exposing them to these electrons that causes radiative damage. And if you expose them to too much, you know, you basically break the structure. So you have very low dose, which gives rise to a very low SNR, SNR image. But if you take a whole bunch of low SNR images, you know, tens of thousands of them, and start properly aligning them, you can average them together. And now you can start to see that there actually is fine structure within these molecules, and this is in two dimensions. It turns out these sort of striations you see, those are actually protein alpha helices running through the molecule. 
Uh, maybe it's easiest to see in this sort of radial view here. And again, we're just trying to, this is a maximum likelihood approach to try to find all the right molecules that are similar projection angles, put them on top of each other so you can now see them. And you can do the same thing in 3D using expectation maximization. Um, the additional challenge here is you need to infer a three-dimensional pose. So when these molecules were frozen, you didn't know their orientation. And so we're trying to infer the orientation so that we can eventually reconstruct a, a 3D density map. Okay. So I would argue that you know um, many of these challenges have been solved. So these unknown particle poses, the low signal to noise, and these image degrading filters in the microscope, we sort of solved. And as a result, over the last like five or six years, I think most of the structures that you guys have probably seen on the covers of journals came from electron microscopy. We're getting regularly structures where you can actually see atomic detail. What is sort of, in my mind, the most interesting and still outstanding challenge is how to deal with structural heterogeneity. And that is, again, this idea that molecules are dancing on this energy landscape. We don't want a single static structure. We want to see a whole ensemble of structures. Okay, so I, I've shown this before, but this is sort of, I think about this, like if I'm trying to dock a small molecule, if I'm trying to think about some inhibitor for a protein complex, I sort of think about that as like trying to feed my son. Um, you know, if you have a static image, it looks like this is a relatively easy problem, but then you go to actually try to do this docking. And of course, it's an extremely dynamic process and it's not entirely clear what the right confirmation is that you're trying to capture. Okay. So, so you can see this in, in two dimensions as well. Um, so what this happens in two dimensions is you get this sort of blurring, right? And so the sort of research question that we actually started when we started in the J clinic about, I guess it's almost been two years ago now, was are there deep, deep learning approaches that allow us to better model this structural heterogeneity? And so the way that we sort of approach this is we started to think about structure um, in terms of a function, right? We thought about it as a mapping function where basically we are trying to take some position in a 3D Cartesian coordinate and learn a mapping function to a density at that position. Now, if you just did that directly, it's probably not all that interesting because now you still have one single structure once you've learned this function. But if you could learn a function like this, then it sort of crossed our minds that maybe you could give an extra input to this function, like say a discrete class, or maybe some position along some continuous reaction coordinate, or ideally some location in some multi-dimensional energy landscape, right? And the question was, you know, can something like an MLP actually serve in this black box where it takes in an input, a 3D Cartesian coordinate, position on energy landscape, and then tells me the density. Okay. So Ellen Zhang, who, who Ignacio and I were just talking about, is this incredible student that jointly joined my lab and Bonnie Berger's group. And she worked with Tristan Bepler, who's also in Bonnie's group, to try to put together this architecture we came up with. So the idea is that um, we set this up as a variational autoencoder. Um, on the decoder side, it takes as inputs a positional code, tries to predict a density, and we're able to train this network um, by comparing the model slice produced by the decoder to the input image. And that loss function allows us to update these neural network weights. The input images are fed through an encoder network. And the goal of the encoder network is to sort of embed these particles in some low dimensional latent space that allows us to encode the heterogeneity and then, of course, that latent code can get passed to the decoder network. This is sort of a standard VAE framework. Okay, so here's how we would, we would sort of imagine using it. You would basically take your particle image stack and you would train your encoder and decoder networks over multiple epochs. And now with these trained networks, which are sort of bespoke for your particular image stack, you could finally embed all of your particle images. And again, we have on the order of you know, 100,000 to a few million particle images. You could embed all these in this low dimensional latent space. And then you could sort of say, okay, from this low dimensional latent space, I wanna just sort of sample at arbitrary positions. And you could do things like, I wanna filter out particles, or I want to look at sort of discrete states that are within my latent space, or maybe I wanna walk some trajectory through this latent space and sort of see the continuous maps. So this is sort of how we imagine this thing might work. And obviously we need to do a bunch of um, development to, to test whether that was true. So the first question was, you know, can these neural networks actually learn mapping functions? And so um, the first mapping function was, okay, can you actually just take a homogeneous structure and use neural networks to predict these 3D density maps as opposed to this sort of traditional expectation maximization approach? And so CryoSpark uses expectation maximization. Again, I think this is just amazing. If you think back to the low resolution or the low SNR images I showed initially, what we can reconstruct are these 3D volumes 
where now these are, this is a protein alpha helix and the little bumps on there, those are individual side chains. You know, that's like a half dozen atoms that are protruding. And you can see those out of that extremely noisy image that we started with, as long as you sort of align and average things properly. And it turns out the neural networks can do that as well, right? So the decoder network can also learn these high resolution features that allow us to really understand the, the function of these proteins in atomic detail. Okay, so then the next question was, you know, for these encoder networks, can we actually embed them in a low dimensional space that has some sort of useful meaning? And the way we went about testing this was to simulate a ground truth data set where we took some mock model uh, molecule and then we just sort of computationally moved the density so that you could have sort of a sweeping motion of say one domain relative to another. So you're starting in this dark sort of whatever color that is, dark, dark gray or blues, and then you're going to this sort of green color. And you could sample that in different ways, right? It could be completely continuous. It could be sort of peaked, but continuous, or it could be actually three discrete states. And the question was, are the, the low dimensional embeddings that we um, get back from this encoder network going to look similar to the particle frequencies that we have here? Okay. And so, you know, it's not perfect, but it's actually quite good. There's a nice correspondence between the true reaction coordinate here shown on the X axis and the learned reaction coordinate here shown on the Y axis. So in this case, our low dimensional um, space was just a one dimensional space. And you can see that the input distribution and the learned distribution are not identical, but they are quite close. That turns out to be true for these other distributions as well. And so that gave us some confidence that we could actually learn some meaningful representations of the underlying heterogeneity. All right, so um, this is all well and fine with sort of um, simulated data. The, the real question was, you know, can we use this on real data to do things like recover relatively rare but biologically informative states, quantify the relative abundance of these states, discover structural interdependencies, and then test hypotheses that relate the experimental uh, conditions to structure. Okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you um, two stories today, uh, both around the ribosome. So I just wanted to sort of orient you with what a ribosome looks like. So on the left, um, this is the sort of mature particle that actually does translation in bacteria. Um, it has a small subunit we call it a 30S and it has a large subunit we call it a 50S. And if you open this up and just look at the 50S, I want you to notice these are the tRNA binding sites. So these are the RNA molecules that come in, they recognize the message RNA, they're decoding that message RNA and converting messenger RNA into protein. So Laurel Kinman is a graduate student in my lab and she teamed up with uh, graduate student Jingyu Sun at um, McGill University in Canada to try to see if we could apply Cryodragon to understand how a bacterial ribosome assembles. And we know that bacterial ribosome assembly relies on a series of um, small protein molecules that act as chaperones that help guide the assembly process. But we didn't really know exactly how a few of them worked and one in particular I'm gonna tell you about, you know, we really knew very little about. So it's this protein called KSGA. Um, we knew that if we depleted it from cells, the resulting ribosomes were broken, but we didn't really know how or why. So the idea was, okay, let's grow cells without this factor called KSGA. We can isolate ribosomes from them. And then we'll treat them with KSGA, um, plunge freeze and image them. And then we'll get back structures, ideally ensembles of structures that will tell us something about what KSGA was doing to remodel the precursor particle to the fully assembled ribosome, right? And if we sort of got a bunch of those images, we might be able to figure out, oh, it's helping to remodel this section or that section of the ribosome. And of course we can do a control where they're untreated all the way through. Okay, so if we first look at the, the treated samples, um, Again, we can reconstruct a homogeneous molecule and what you'll sort of see, uh, maybe this is a little bit uh, too detailed, but you can see that there's resolution and isotropy. So the core of the molecule is in green. Um, that has a resolution of something like five angstroms, but the distal elements of it are, are more poorly resolved. And that's typically a sign of some blurring or some sort of motion that's going on there. So this is our first sign that, okay, upon treatment of KSGA, there were regions of the molecule that were likely being remodeled. Okay, so we can look at the learned latent space and you can see that it's featured, right? So um, this is this low dimensional embedding that comes out of Cryodragon. And you can see that there are regions um, of high particle density that are sort of separated from other regions of high particle density. And so the first obvious question is like, what are the structures there? And we were really excited to see that they're extremely distinct. So in this sort of one test tube, 
not only do you get one structure of ribosome, it turns out that there are at least four different structures. Some of them are missing what we call the head and the platform. Others are missing just the platform, but have the head. Others yet have all the elements, but we don't see the factor bound. And then still another one has the factor bound, that's KSGA. And I think this sort of exposes one of the powers of, of single particle cryo-EM. You would never get this by crystallography. If you were to crystallize this mixture, one of these four, for example, would preferentially crystallize. That's the structure you would see. And you would have totally lost the fact that these other populations were sort of in your sample. And it turns out these populations can be informative to understand the function. Okay, so I've just sampled four points here. There's a whole bunch of other particles everywhere else. And so, you know, we have this generative model where we've embedded everything in this continuous landscape. How can we better characterize all the structures that are there? And so the first maybe naive approach that we took was just saying, okay, well, let's just sort of take 500 k-mean center points throughout this latent space. And that sort of nicely covers all of the, the particles that were embedded. And then for each of those 500 structures or 500 points, we can generate a structure. So now you have 500 density maps that you somehow need to make sense of and then come up with a model for <laughs> biologically what's happening. And the thought was, well, we know what the mature ribosome looks like, like where all the RNA helices and all the ribosomal proteins are in the mature structure. So maybe we can use that information as like a prior to sort of understand which elements have been formed and haven't been formed in each one of these 500 structures. So, so the way one would do that is you basically dock an atomic model into this 3D density map. And then for every structural element, say an RNA helix or um, a ribosomal protein, you could say, well, what fraction of the density that I would expect to see do I actually observe in any particular map, right? And you quantify that sort of between zero and one as a fraction on density. And you could display all that data as a heat map. So now each one of these rows is one of 500 3D density maps. And each one of the columns is some structural element. And probably if you, if you don't think about ribosomes, all you look at this, you're just like, all right, I see a lot of blue and white. What, what does that actually mean, Joey? So because this is a heat map like this, we can hierarchically cluster it and we can ask what groups of structural elements are similar in their occupancy patterns across all of the density maps. So that might be like, this whole block is all similar to each other. Whereas, um, and, and let's say this block is sort of similar to each other. They're present in these density maps and absent in these density maps. And so we can just map them. And what was sort of nice to see was that, okay, this sort of recapitulates maybe what we would expect. There's a core of the ribosomal particle that is um, these blues and purples. That's basically present in all of our maps. And then there are these distal elements in the head and the platform that are present in some structures and absent in others. And so again, this is sort of nice confirmation that we can recapitulate elements of ribosomal biology that we know from you know, decades of biochemical experiments with these neural networks. So one question you might ask is, um, I see structures that are extremely immature, right? They're missing the head, they're missing the platform, and I see structures that are extremely mature. How might these two things interconvert? What was sort of cool about this analysis is that you can find evidence of multiple pathways to interconvert between the immature and the mature particles. So you can find some where the head is present, but the platform is absent. And you can find others where the platform is present, but the head is absent. And so that actually tells you something, right? That tells you that there must be some sort of um, parallel assembly or disassembly pathways. In this case, you can form the head first. And in this case, you can form the platform first. Right? And so, um, so, so that's kind of an interesting thing. There's not an obligate order to build this particle. You can start with the core, and then you have a choice. You can make the head or you can make the platform. We can ask questions like, well, what types of particles can this factor bind? Does it bind to all of these, um, all of these, these types of particles or only a subset of them? And so, for example, we can go through and just look at the particles that have KSGA bound and then look at their structures. So you see things where KSGA is binding to fully intact particles. This is maybe what most people would have expected. You also find particles where they're lacking the platform and particles where they're lacking the head. And again, this tells you something about biology. It says that KSGA is really recognizing just the local environment, only the local RNA helices and proteins of where it binds. And it doesn't actually care about these distal elements, right? It can bind without the head or it can bind with the head. So that again, that sort of tells you something about, let's say you wanted to make a small molecule that blocked binding of this thing, you know, you really need to be focused on the binding site and not on these distal elements. Um, we can go through, you know, like there's, there's a bunch of ways you can use this generative model. One might be to try to ask like, what are the interdependencies between binding of some 
uh, protein and, and some other protein or RNA helix. And so, for example, if we look at KSGA, we might ask, you know, what is its influence on the occupancy of this helix 44? And you can just plot that as a scatter plot, and you can see that they're mutually exclusive. So if you have KSGA bound, you don't have helix 44 and vice versa, right? So it says that there's some like interdependence between these two, and in this case, it's a mutually exclusive relationship. And what's nice about having the data in this form is that you can do this across all of the elements. Um, so I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna just skip to one section in the interest of time. Uh, oh no, it actually is the right slide, I'm sorry. So for example, you could do it between this pair, this um, S6 and S3. And if you looked at this, you could say, okay, well, I wanna make some thresholds where something is bound or free. And in this case, you would say, well, S6 and S3 can bind independently, right? I can find evidence of S3 bound without S6, and I can find evidence of S6 bound without S3. And so that tells you that those two things are binding independently. And we can find examples of other things that aren't um, independent like that. So here, for example, you can find evidence of S3 being present without helix 33, but you never see helix 33 present without S3. And so that provides a directionality for assembly of these two elements. Helix 33 must be downstream of S3. And we can do this across all of the elements that go into the ribosome, right? So from these maps, we can start to build up these dependency charts of what's required to form you know, the fully mature structure. And this has sort of been like the, the holy grail for ribosome biogenesis people for a long time is to try to figure out like, how do you couple RNA, bind, RNA folding and protein binding? Um, what are the order of events in which this occurs? And is there an obligate order or not? And so by inspecting these maps over and over and over again, we can build up these dependencies um, and really start to understand those sort of the couplings of these multiple events. Okay. This is where I wanted to skip. So, so that's sort of the, the, the flavor of the types of things that we can do um, with CryoDragon. The, where I wanted to leave you guys with though, and what I think is most exciting now is trying to think about um, how do we do this in a cell? Okay, so I sort of started this talk by saying CryoAM is super cool because we can actually look at structural heterogeneity, right? Uh, we can look at molecules sort of dancing and moving and going through their function. What I've shown you so far requires that these are highly purified samples. So that is some graduate student went off and lysed a cell, like broke it open, and then spent multiple days purifying this protein of interest. And our, you know, our baseline hope is like, okay, the protein is still sort of in the ensemble of confirmations that it functions at in the cell, but we don't know that, right? We've spent all this time purifying it away from the rest of the cellular milieu. The other thing we don't know is, is we've explicitly purified it away from everything else because that allows us to sort of image it well. Um, but now we've lost the cellular context. Right? So if there are different types of confirmations, it certainly could be the case that some confirmations are favored in one portion of the cell and other confirmations are favored or more present in a different portion of the cell. But since we burst the cell open, we have no idea which one came from where. Right? And um, more recently, oops, um, more recently, there's a new technique called um, cryo-electron tomography that has really sort of gained a bunch of steam. And the idea here is instead of putting um, purified proteins on this grid, you're actually just gonna put down cells. So these could be human cells in this illustration from a 2009 review, this is actually a bacterial sample. So you would grow bacteria on this grid, all intact. You would rapidly freeze them. And now there's a couple problems. One is that the sample is even more complex than what we started with before. And the other is that we have like a physically thick specimen, right? Because there's a Z axis to this cell. And that means that you might have particles stacked on top of each other uh, on your in your imaging plane. And if you're sort of integrating down this axis, if you have things on top of each other, it's problematic to be able to separate them out. But what we can now do in the microscope is that we can physically tilt the stage. And if we're physically tilting the stage, we can generate sort of a 3D tomogram of that volume and that allows us to disambiguate the sort of z axis and extract individual particles from the different slices through the cell. And so Barrett Powell's a really talented graduate student in my lab um, who's been working on sort of the methodology to do electron tomography in our group and then also to sort of apply some of the machine learning approaches um, that, that Ellen developed to look at um, 
these uh, these heterogeneous structures in cellular samples. Okay, so um, just to get a sense of like what the raw data looks like, here is a raw tomogram. I'm going to pause it sort of portion of the way through. And what's happening here is we're basically just tilting through the sample, and hopefully here you can start to see this line that I've highlighted with my cursor. That's actually the cellular membrane, right? So this is the membrane that forms the outside of this bacteria. And as we tilt further through, you can probably start to see, if you squint enough, some hazes that look like little circles through here. Um, it's a little bit easier to see as you go further in. Turns out that those are ribosomes that are just around in the cell, right? Those are things that are presumably actively translating protein and allowing the cell to survive until the moment that we froze it. Okay, so as you can see, you know, if you thought the single particle images were relatively low signal noise ratio, these are even worse. And these are even worse because, again, we're dose limited, right? So you used to have so much dose you could apply to the sample at a single tilt angle. Now we've got to tilt the whole stage and we have to spread the dose out across this whole tilt series. And that means each individual image is even lower signal to noise ratio. So it creates additional computational challenges. Okay, despite all that, if you do enough signal processing upstream, you can generate something that looks like this. So again, here is the cellular membrane. And then Barrett has gone through and just sort of set a contour level where he could see individual ribosomes. And then he used a sort of a template matcher um, to pick out individual ribosomes that are in this cell or what we think are individual ribosomes. How would you really know? They're so smooth and hard to tell, right? It's hard to see what they are. It turns out if you take all of those particles, you can use image alignment algorithms to try to align all those subtomograms together. And I think this is just absolutely incredible to me. This is roughly a 3.5 angstrom structure of the ribosome and it was resolved in a cell, right? Like this was actually in a growing cell before it was imaged. And you know the resolution is not as high as you can achieve with single particle, but you can see the sort of features that structural biologists care about. We can still see alpha helices. We can see bulky sign shades protruding from them. Um, it, certainly if you had an atomic model, you could dock it into this easily. And in some cases, you know, if we push the resolution a little further, I think we could actually de novo build atomic models into this and really understand what the structures were like in the cell. And um, so, so this data set was previously published, um, which is, is sort of here, and then Barrett reprocessed it. And I think one of the most exciting things is that this data set was actually um, collected in two different conditions. One, in the presence of a small molecule chloramphenicol. This is a known ribosomal inhibitor. And when we looked very closely at our maps, you can actually see in the presence of chloramphenicol, there's extra density here that is missing in the absence of chloramphenicol. That's right where that drug should bind. And so like, you know, we reproduce this, but this is really like the first time anyone has ever seen a drug binding to a target in the cell. And so I think this like opens the door for doing this sort of like really exciting structural biology that people always want to do. Like where are drugs acting? What are their targets? In theory, you know, like five years from now, you could actually just look in the cell and see the targets of the compound that you've added. Okay, that was all with static structures, assuming things aren't moving. The next obvious question is how do you extend this to think about heterogeneity? And so Barrett sort of took the framework that Ellen had, had developed, this um, variational autoencoder, um, which is again shown here with a particle image going through an encoder network, a decoder network, and then a reconstruction, and tried to expand this now to take advantage of these tilt series. So here now, instead of a single image coming in, you have 40 tilt images. These are all correlated because they came from the same particle. And so he's extended um, our encoder network to basically merge each one of these tilt images to a single particle encoding. And then the decoder actually looks quite similar. Um, it does have sort of a little bit of extra information. It has to know the tilt angle that it needs to compare to, but largely this is the same idea. Okay, so now these images are much worse than what we're used to dealing with. There's this extra sort of detail of, of having to deal with the tilts. Um, but we sort of went through the same workflow of can we first reconstruct homogeneous structures um, by looking strictly at the decoder network? And it turns out we can. So you can take particles. This is, um, we did this first at low resolution. This is the traditional reconstruction. This is various epochs of training. You can see the very early training. You don't really see a ribosome, but then as it progresses, eventually you see particles that basically recapitulate the structure of the traditional reconstruction. So the neural networks, even in this low SNR regime, can reconstruct reasonable volumes, um, or at least for these low resolution features. We then wanted to see, okay, can we push the resolution? We know that by traditional algorithms, you can get to this three and a half angstrom's resolution, more or less. Um, and this is sort of where we're stuck right now. Um, so 
taking a traditional reconstruction, we get these nice high resolution features. Right now in the neural networks, um, we're probably limited to something like 10 or 15 angstroms. And so you can still see gross morphology of the ribosome, but clearly there are features that are missing. And so this is one of the things that we're sort of pushing on now. Is this an issue with hyperparameters and how we've set up the neural network architecture? Is there additional image pre-processing that we think we should be doing before uh, feeding to the neural networks? Um, my personal preferences or likelihood is that it's on this image pre-processing, but this is something that we're working through um, with the hope that eventually we'll be able to get to these high resolution structures. On the other side of it, we're interested in whether you can actually encode this heterogeneity. And so we tested this again with simulated data. Um, and so here, we've just taken four sort of mock ribosomes. We've simulated um, a thousand randomly oriented subtomograms for each one of these four structures, and then train this Tomo Dragon encoder network on it. And you see that it nicely separates out the four particles. Um, and there's a confusion matrix, you know, we're getting the same labels for each one. So we can actually encode this heterogeneity quite nicely. So with those two pieces in, in place, we thought, well, we should be able to look at real data now. And even if we can't go to high resolution, maybe we can learn something interesting. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry. So you can actually reconstruct those and you get back the volumes you expect. Okay, so um, Barrett went back to this original, um, this original tomogram and he said, okay, well, I'll just take these picked particles and I'll run them through the, the pipeline as we've described. And so the first thing that comes out is that you see you get a nicely featured latent space. That is to say that it looks like there are distinct structures in there, whether those are imaging artifacts or really distinct structures, you don't know until you reconstruct. But I think the most exciting thing, you know, this just happened in the last week or so, is he went through and did reconstructions and you can find evidence of structures. Uh, and I want you to sort of focus between the large subunit and the small subunit here, those tRNA binding sites I introduced at the beginning of the talk. Here you can see there's nice density in one class and it's completely absent in another class. Right? And so we can go through and look at an atomic model. It turns out that is the, um, that is the A site tRNA. That's the, the sort of site that allows the initial tRNA to come in to start the, the rounds of translation. And so we think that we're finding two different classes. Some of these are ribosomes that are actively translating. They have these uh, tRNA sites bound and there are other ribosomes that are sort of in between rounds of translation or are not actively translating. And therefore they have these empty sites. And again, what's really cool about this is that we're seeing this in a cellular context. So you could do things now like say, okay, well, for all of my ribosomes that have a bound tRNA, where are they in the cell? Am I more likely to see actively translating um, ribosomes in the periphery or towards the, the center of the cell? Am I more likely to see actively translating ribosomes associated with a membrane and actively secreting proteins, et cetera? And so you could go through this for all sorts of structural hypotheses when you see different types of states you can ask them where are they on, where are they in the cell. Okay, so that's sort of all I put together for today. Um, again, I want to really highlight a few people that did like all this work. So Ellen, sort of shown here, um, did all the initial single particle work um, for CryoDragon. Laurel, a uh, really talented graduate from my lab, did all of the KSGA work that I talked about for the um, bacterial ribosome. And then Barrett, who's over here, is the one that's sort of pushing ahead with Tomo Dragon to try to look at these structures in cells. And yeah, happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Joey. Oh, that's uh, that does a lot, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have uh, questions. But uh, I'll let people uh, please uh, join the conversation. Thank you. Is anyone actually out there? Oh yeah, we have a group of them. Yeah, a little bit shy, but uh, look, here's a question on the chat. From hey, Putin. David. Good to see you. Do you see this question, uh, Joy, on the chat? Oh, uh, no. Uh, let me. Yeah, Peter is asking. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, where is it? Sorry. Oh, right. So the question is like, so, so how do you get from these um, sort of conformational changes that you may observe to try to figure out protein function, right? So, yeah, I mean, I think this is like one of the the sort of lessons of structure biology generally is that. You know, you go in thinking like, oh, if only I could see more confirmations, I could learn, I could understand this system better. Um, I think in reality, like what we're learning now is that we're awash in different structures. And the real questions are like, which ones are functionally relevant? And then for the ones that are functionally relevant, what are they actually doing? And for that, like, you know, I'm sort of experimentalist by training, like 
I think you have to go back and do experiments, right? So these different confirmations will make very specific hypotheses. You would say like, oh, in this confirmation, I can see that there is a charge-charge interaction between this lysine and this aspartate, and that should stabilize that confirmation. You can go in and make those site-directed mutagen, mutagens and see if that breaks function or doesn't break function, and that can tell you whether that function, whether that uh, structure is correlated with some function. Um, another question, in cryotomography, how do you identify the ribosome from all the blobs? What's the accuracy of the classification? Yeah, that's a great question. So because when you do the first um, particle picking, the resolution is so low before you've done any averaging, you really can't tell the difference between any blobs that are similarly sized. And we think that's actually one of the places where this continuous embedding is going to be really powerful. Because when you, you pick everything, you'll mix particles, some will be junk, some will be good ribosomes. And what we found, at least with the single particle work, is that when you embed this in the low dimensional space, the sort of out of distribution things, which I would say are the drunk, really get pushed literally out of the distribution in that low dimensional space. And so you can use that as a way to classify uh, the good particles from the bad particles, or in our case, the ribosomes from the non ribosomes. Does that make sense, Jason? Um, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Uh, I had a follow up comment on that was that um, so it seems that you're just doing this on tomography. But if you had um, single particle cryogame data, could you like pre-train a model on like the images from the single particle and how they have a better resolution of some of the yep. ribosomes or the proteins and then use that to maybe um, the same model uh, on this tomography, which has lower resolution? Yeah, it's a great question. So people do this, um, a similar idea that they call like high resolution template matching. So, so the basic idea is if you have some prior that is a relatively high resolution thing, then you can go off and just search for that. Um, you can imagine that the dangers there are the same dangers you get with any sort of template matching of sort of model bias. Um, if you go off and search for Einstein and noise, you'll find Einstein and noise. And so there's some, you know, you have to be a little bit careful with exactly how you apply it. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, I don't follow up, but I guess someone else has a question. Um, feel free to jump in. But like, um, I was curious about how you, uh, Take account the time series data in your um, the model. Um, like, how is that input to, to the model? Like, yeah, the time series. Of yeah, we haven't done anything. Years. So I think this is a really cool direction to go. That we haven't um, we thought about a bunch and we've <laughs> written proposals, but haven't actually done anything with is to use time series data. So right now, you know, you have a static snapshot and you try to infer orderings of structures based on chemical intuition. Right. So. It's, it's relatively easy if you see, like we, we study macromolecular complex assembly. And so you sort of know what a more assembled and a less assembled state looks like. And we know that it's downhill to assemble in certain contexts. And so we can get an ordering there. But what we'd really like to do um, is be able to freeze grids in a temporally staged manner. And then you could reconstruct ensembles from each one of your time points. And then try to think about smart ways to merge all of those ensembles to tell you like how the distribution moves or changes over time. But yeah, something that we haven't done yet. I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. it seems very interesting. Other questions. Maybe I can just ask like a general question, like what fraction of the folks on here sort of work with imaging data? And what kind of stuff do you guys typically work with? I know what David does. Most other names I don't yeah, recognize. Being a little bit shy. Uh, David says not so much imaging. I'm curious to hear other people's answers to your question, Joey, but um, perhaps uh, you know, a, a much broader question is now that you're here, well, you've been here at MIT for a few years, um, but now that you're more and more engaged in the J Clinic community, what do, you, what do you think you're looking for from your colleagues in terms of right, what, what do you think you could really bring to your research agenda by really dipping into the machine learning research that's going yeah. on all around you? Yeah, I mean, I think, I would say, like, writ large, we're super naive about approaches that are out there, right? Um, and so I think, you know, like, if people are interested in this sort of stuff, I feel like, yeah, just coming and talking to us about it and 
what are the challenges that we're facing? Like we're very good at articulating what doesn't work. <laughs> um, but given the naivety we have around like ML approaches, it's not totally obvious to us what the solution is. You know, just as an example, like why are we hitting these resolution limits um, in this, these tomographic series that we don't hit with single particle? And so, you know, there's a bunch of hyperparameter sweeps that we could do across the, the different architectures. Um, and we've done a little bit of that, but we haven't done that very thoroughly. There's completely different architectures that one could imagine for all of these things that maybe would have uh, a higher likelihood of going to higher resolution at the, the cost of something else, right? But um, yeah, I would love to talk to people at J Clinic about like how to be really thoughtful about making those choices. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you like, you know, there, there's all sorts of challenges in structural biology right now that I think are probably very amenable to machine learning. And part of the challenge in getting those implemented is like, there's a language barrier and there's a technology barrier and both those are quite steep in both arenas. And I think, you know, one of the uh, things that Ellen was able to do extremely well and why the single particle stuff worked well is that, you know, she's able to sort of speak both of those languages and move between those two areas really effectively. Do you think we need new classes here at MIT to help create more people like that? Yeah, I would love to teach a class. I was like, I've been talking to people in the department here about trying to teach like a, one of the, um, what do they call it? Like the common core or one of the core classes for um, Schwarzman College where it'd be like six units on biological image processing and then six units of machine learning. Like one of those paired classes I would love to teach. Um, so that's something I've been thinking about, yeah. Happy to speak to you about that offline, given that uh, I'm co-chairing that committee with Ankur Mudra. Oh, um, great, yeah. <laughs> but uh, getting back to the actual concrete question that you raised, um, can you overfit? So as you pump up the capacity, at least for points in your training data, can you yep. get the, the granularity you want? Yeah, so, so, um, so I guess there's two parts to that. So one, if we just continue to train, um, one of two things happens either the resolution doesn't improve or we start to get these like overfitting artifacts where we see high resolution features, but they're clearly not like biologically relevant, right? It'll be like some disconnected density that can't possibly be part of a protein because it's. But you're talking about for held out data, but what about for your training data? So, so, say again. What about for your training data? So there's not really like a holdout and training set. The way that so, so all of the data goes in every single epoch um, yeah but you can still sort of overtrain that where you end up sort of reproducing high resolution features that fit better to your input image but that's because it's high resolution noise in your input image that's not biologically meaningful and you create your own data joy say again do you create your own data yeah yeah so most of the i mean most of the lab two-thirds of the lab um, does all experimental work where they're the ones purifying proteins and going over to MIT Nano to collect data on the microscopes here. Yeah, so most of the data I showed you is, is our data. Uh, I guess the tomography data is not, but the rest of the data is, yeah. And do you collaborate with other groups outside MIT that are doing a similar work? Yeah, we haven't on the computational side of it, but on the experimental side of it, there's been a ton of people that are interested in the single particle workflows that have brought data sets to us that we've worked with, with them on. Um, uh, but yeah, we're pretty well equipped to collect all of our own data, so we haven't had to do that through collaboration. Um, I, I have one question. It's like I thought about the cry um, problem a little bit. Um, how much of it is just like? like the noise problem that the image processing isn't great. So your machine learning model has a lot of uh, possibility to uh, yeah, just learn noise instead of um, the actual signal there. Uh, yeah, is it, is, it, is it like a viable machine learning problem in that sense? Yeah, I mean, I think along some axes, it's like really well suited because you have a preponderant, preponderous amount of data, right? Like we can, um, you know, I, I was just talking to a postdoc the other day. So he collected, um, I think 14,000 what we call movies or movie micrographs and from each one of those he can extract something on the order of like 300 particles right and that, and that data was collected in like two days so you can collect a ton of images but as you say each one of them the SNR is terrible and again I think that 
sort of comes down to these fundamental limitations of radiation damage. If we could really dose the samples as much as we wanted, then most of these problems go away. The problem is that we just can't apply much dose because the biological material is super fragile. And when it gets exposed to ionizing radiation, it breaks down. Um, so, so yeah, so, so along some axes, yeah, you, you might say, oh, the data is like too noisy to be amenable to ML, but along other axes, there's so much of it. And that's typically regimes where ML works well, right? You were showing, Joy, earlier, this uh, COVID spike protein. Uh, have you uh, captured these, like how that moves, how that... Uh, what yeah, right. So, so Jason how McKellen... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so Jason McKellen um, solved one of the early structures of it in like, you know, it was March or April of 2020. And, and I happen to know him. So he sent us our, his data set when we were all on lockdown and Ellen processed it. And it was really cool. I mean, you could see, so there's there's sort of, it's a trimer and there's something called the receptor binding domain. So these sort of, I guess, around my head, if those were each one of the RBDs. And um, the machine learning models really nicely capture that there are two distinct confirmations of each one of those. And you can see things where there's one RBD up or two RBDs up or three RBDs up and sort of all permutations of those. And so you can really nicely see those motions. And it is effective, right? It has the right structure to to be uh, harmful, to, to be a... Uh... Well, at least to bind an ACE receptor, oh, and, exactly. yeah, at least to bind I, I, ACE receptor I, 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 and then all the things <laughs> downstream of that, we haven't really captured because uh, like all of the structures, I'm a, there's like COVID aficionados on here, but all the structures are what's known as like the stabilized prefusion confirmation where they've made mutations to keep it from going to this long, elongated thing where it then allows the membranes to fuse. Um, so, you know, whether the RBDs up and down are only affecting ACE binding or also affecting the prefusion, postfusion states, we don't know, but they certainly affect ACE binding and we can see different comp or different compositions of up and down. So interesting, yeah. Well, a lot of work to do here, I, I can tell, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this, if anyone is uh, more interested uh, to continue on this work research, uh, help somehow, or like, uh, what, what is the best way to approach uh, you? Like, uh, reach yeah, out just send an email. I'm, I'm very responsive to emails. Uh, or come by the office. Like, I'm in Building 68, so I'm probably right across the uh, right across the courtyard from you guys. That's that's nearby. Excellent. All right. So okay. So I don't know if there's any other question. Uh, but it's fine. We can even give you five minutes back. So this is excellent. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> you can take care of everyone. Thank you so much again, Joy. That was yeah, uh, really exciting. It was amazing. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good one. Have a good one. Take care now. Bye-bye now.